comment here. I'm not sure if this comes up in our videos, video feed that's happening, but another comment saying, wouldn't it be amazing if there was a package manager for APOs, APIs so you could just app to get the SDK for your platform? And, you know, like the, I think as, as APIs get, um, uh, increase in the, uh, the level that are out there, we're going to need those sorts of automated service discovery tools in our, um, uh, in our architectures. Uh, okay, that's wonderful. Um, Madhu, great to have you here. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Um, and you're talking about resilience in the workplace. I am, indeed, yeah. So uh, thanks for having me. So I'm Madhu, I'm a software engineering manager at Capital One. And uh, yeah, I'm going to start off by talking about what resilience is. Um, so if we look at you know dictionary definition of um, resilience, let me move forward first. There we go. Um, the dictionary says is the ability to bounce back after encountering a challenging situation or stressful life events, which is you know part of life, inevitable. Uh, but then I noticed some people really flourish under stress. How do they do it? And that got me thinking, what resilience would mean in the workplace? Why is it even important? And in the workplace, resilience is about, you know, being able to manage everything, whether it could be a difficult workload, it could be frustrating colleagues, it could be annoying behaviours. And it's, it's ad that adaptability, the flexibility uh, by which, you know, you, you can uh, overcome these situations. And that's what I refer to as resilience in the workplace. Um, consider a workplace that's undergoing radical change. Um, I'm sure most of us here have been uh, subjected to working from home uh, due to COVID. And the effect of that might be detrimental to some stuff. So back in March, at today's notice, we were asked to work from home. And uh, I'm sure I thought, well, how is this going to be even possible? And then the following week, when children started working also from home, uh, just like us, we wondered, you know, how can I manage this work and childcare? What about homeschooling? Uh, where should I set up my home office? Will I be distracted by housework? And all of these are about being resilient and how well we can cope with some of these major changes, events that occur. Uh, particularly, you know, in the current situation we are in, this becomes extremely important. Uh, we spend a third of our day at work so we need to be able to identify what is causing stress in the first place and put in place measures to overcome that. And there's, there's been plenty of research and so on to say, you know, how resilient people are flexible. They can adapt to new and different situations, uh, how they learn from experience and how they are optimistic and they know when to ask for help when they need it and so on. Uh, can people become resilient so if I'm not very resilient can I learn how to be one and absolutely yes you can that's the short answer uh, resilience can be learned it's a skill unlike any skill with practice you can master this resilience uh, it can lead to improved performance at work um, both for us as employees and for the organization as well now going into how resilience is going to impact us in the workplace so let's start with some numbers. 65% uh, of US employees view their jobs as the number one stressor in their lives. Uh, job insecurity, limited control over what they can do, peer conflict, all contributing to this stress. And when the work environment's unhealthy or difficult, it can lead to negative physical and mental health outcomes. When I was a new manager many, many years ago, I used to think that showing emotions at work was unprofessional, was weak. Um, as a lead, I felt I had to stay positive at all times to support the team. And as a woman in tech, I cared a lot about how I was perceived in order to contract the stereotypes. I did not want to appear as if I was unable to manage my team efficiently because I was being emotional. However, you know, through experience, I learned that was not the best path for me or the team. I uh, missed out on opportunities to be more vulnerable. But over time, I've learned that having emotions, showing emotions is actually human. Staying true to myself is what is actually the most courageous thing I can do. And most companies today focus on employees' well-being. You know, they don't want employees to be burnt out. Uh, burnout impacts 
their engagement, their work-life balance negatively. But we need to start having open and honest conversations to support one another. And I don't know how much that happens in your workplace, but uh, in CAP1, you know, we constantly encourage people to come out and speak about stuff if things aren't working their way. And it's not like we have a magic wand to fix all problems, but certainly talking about things just highlight some of the improvements that we could potentially do um, in the enterprise. And there are many, many, many benefits of having a workforce that is very resilient. People are more motivated. They are capable of dealing with change. They're less susceptible to burnout. And when and you know the employees' overall health is improved, um, we found out that the resilience and well-being is very closely linked. Better mental health and in turn improving people's performance. Now, having that capacity to deal with the ongoing stress at work, to adapt efficiently to change, to cope with the threat of job loss, um, perhaps, to handle the pressure of deadlines, it's important not only to succeed at work, but also for our overall health and well-being. Now, resilience is associated with greater job satisfaction, work happiness, employee engagement. It contributes to improved self-esteem personally, um, sense of control, sense of purpose. And all these leads to employees actually reaping the rewards of improved productivity. But most of us will be able to identify a resilient person. We might struggle to pin down what exactly makes them resilient. Is it their positivity? It's not quite as simple as that. It's not positivity that makes them resilient. It's actually the other way around. Resilience enables a more positive approach to work and an outlook on life, which in turn enables better problem solving and helps to maintain that motivation. And uh, in a recent survey of skills, 57% of employers saw resilience as a key skill for the candidate and 71% viewed the ability to adapt as also a key skill. And that's that's one of the core aspects of resilience. And, uh, you know, these just reveal that businesses do place high value on employees who can demonstrate resilience. And moving on again. So how can we go about building a, a resilient workplace? Um, so creating a resilient workforce and more healthy culture takes commitment, but it can be done. Um, so the first thing is creating a resilient culture. Now, organizational cultures has many layers. It's built on, uh, you know, being able to empower people, trust them, accountability, responsibilities. So promote an open and trusting management style and ensure managers actually understand the importance of supporting mental well-being of staff. Uh, this, this, this is a big commitment, right? So it requires action, it requires regular communication. Um, it's it's in addition to the day job, so it, it can take time. Um, sometimes a mind shift change, but that's 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 critical to create, um, to building that resilient workforce. Uh, and then understanding your employees. So resilient employees make resilient organizations, plenty of research to support that. But people who are supported, who are motivated, who are equipped, they are best positioned to overcome obstacles and distractions. Um, it's important it's to start learning about what work-related stresses are impacting employees most. Ask how you know, it can support their goal of reducing their stress and improving their resilience. Um, you know, this can be done. We do them through surveys, work satisfaction surveys. Uh, we sort of add stress and resilience-related questions. Um, in like risk assessments. And uh, once we have the data, once we collect the data, we know the, the, the impact of stress, we start to build a plan for um, improving the resilience. That, that ultimately leads to a very healthy work culture. Um, and it's important for leadership to be engaged. So resilient workplace definitely requires leadership buy-in, uh, has to happen from the top. Employees are more likely to participate when they know that the leader is supporting them. So, but if leaders are not on board sharing, you know, results from uh, surveys, you know, it's, it's almost, um, it's not going to give us the right results. And then resiliency training. Um, 
you know, in a dynamic work environment, which is what most software development work is like, um, it elevates job performance, resilience, and uh, work engagement. So innovative strategies to improve employee health and organization performance are highlighted in a report by, uh, you know, leading researchers. So definitely consider resiliency training. And then look for various ways to improve the work environment, whether it's um, you know, physical offices or virtual locations like we're currently in. Uh, it's important to become flexible. So allow autonomy where possible, let people do their jobs, uh, flexible schedules. So you know, uh, reduce the need for like late work, again, not burnt out. And if shift work is required, there should be some uh, you know, flexibility where possible. Um, then be reasonable about the work expectations. You should be vigilant about you know their policies on work expectations and hours. The drive to succeed can result in pushing people to increase workloads. It can backfire and undermine productivity and results. So, I mean, a bunch of things for employers to do, but what can we do as employees? Um, take active steps to stop yourself from getting burnt out. Um, improved sleeping habits uh, definitely contributes to that. I'm sure that, you know, we've all seen that. Remain calm under pressure. Don't give in to it. Don't be nervous. Um, Communicate, communicate, communicate. So biggest thing, really. Um, tell someone that you know, if you're not feeling uh, comfortable doing something. Um, this is a slightly different one. Lots of people have taken to different ways uh, during lockdown, I'm sure. But take on a new hobby if you can. That's supposed to improve well-being and in turn improve resilience as well. Um, and finally, improving physical health is also linked to improve resilience. Yeah. Yeah. Coping strategies like mindfulness can help help improve judgment, accuracy, decision making, lifestyle factors, getting enough exercise and eating healthy. Then finally, having a strong support network outside of work can also help support and contribute to a more resilient skill set. And I think that's about it. Sorry, I have this through because I thought it was like five minutes late we've started. So I should try and finish as swiftly as I can. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions. Mark, Victor? A bit of a lag every time. Um, how do you, so thanks, Madhu, that was fantastic. The, um, uh, I'm glad it was put in here as a um, speaking talk. I'm sorry. At first, I thought you, you were going to be speaking about resilient architecture, but it was such a breath of fresh air for us to be able to step back. Uh, Maddy had talked about, um, you know, the API Days conference being about the humans behind the APIs, and you really brought that home. I think with, you know, just facing up to. It's not just about. Um, making sure our businesses are COVID resilient, but also that the staff as we move to the, the remote workplaces. So really great um, uh, uh, and pertinent um, for presentation to be offering. We do have one question. How do you manage your boss when they know more than you or intrusively micromanage, even when they don't know the details of your work? Do you have any tips on how to manage that stress? Um, yeah, absolutely. So it's very important to manage your boss. I think that's the first thing. Uh, and it's good on you to recognize that you need to manage your boss. Um, frequent updates uh, could be one. Uh, but try and find out what exactly is it that your boss needs to know. Um, and that would be one way of doing it. Just check if what... F first one is check your understanding. You know, Find out what your boss wants from you and then do that. But the second thing is find and see if you can... Um, help your boss achieve their goals by picking up some of the activities um, that they think that you can do. So step up to the challenge almost by helping them deal with some of their uh, workload and maybe show yourself up. That's definitely another way. Um, yeah. And if they have a clear career path and then you have a clear career path, and hopefully you can match the two and see which way it's going. Then there should hopefully be less friction, you know, when you're managing the two. 
That's interesting. I love the idea that you that you mention. Um, you know, understanding what they need. I've, I know I've worked with micromanagers in the past where you can't. It's sometimes you can't ask them that sort of thing directly because they don't really know. But if, as you say, if you're listening out for it, then you know, like I've had someone who was constantly asking about. Um, stuff that was and then I realized oh she wants to see what's getting presented to the client so I always anything that was you know I always showed that first and it's that whole you, yeah listening out for well, it's a little bit it's the it's the communicate 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 that you said but it's the listing part of that I guess yeah the yeah. we've got another question do you have any advice for engineers who are interested in becoming team leads uh, absolutely yes so if, if it's um you know if it's by team lead i'm not sure if you're just referring to technical lead or if you want to become a people lead um but either way if you want to lead and if you can show yourself as doing that already then the path is clear but if you are not yet at the stage find the gaps find the gaps between what you are not able to do currently versus what you know, a team lead is able to do in your team, for example, and try and bridge those gaps, try and narrow down the gaps as much as you can. But before that, tell your manager or, or whoever it is that you call in the in the team uh, that you want to be a team lead and how they can support you in doing so. Then, I mean, some of that's going to get much harder to do now that we're all remote. I mean, I guess uh, you, you, I guess you're seeing a lot of teams being using Slack or Yammer or um, Micro, uh, or other sort of tools for messaging for internal collaboration. I'm actually saying no. This is more personal, right? So it would have one-to-one -one conversations with your manager. Uh, That's what I mean. But if you're now more in a, so I mean, just trying to think through that point that you're making now about the um, identifying where the gaps are and being a greater support to your team. How does that change now that you're having to do that? If everyone's remote in your team. How do you use those sorts of tools to identify those gap opportunities? Uh, yeah, sure. Networking is a lot harder remotely. But again, your manager should be able to support you. Uh, right. So if you say, I want to become a team lead, but I don't know what I need to do to become a team lead, you can you guide me, show me the path how to do so? Your manager might start with giving you a list, potentially, of things that he would expect from a team lead that you're potentially not doing currently. Right. That would be one way, but I don't know. So, would you have an architect team in your in your office? Are you liaising with the architecture team, working with them to find out what's coming up next? Are you looking at recent trends in the industry? Are you able to bring that back onto uh, your project, your team, your manager? Are you able to use some of those? Um, what are you doing that is a step above the rest of your team to qualify for that lead position? Wonderful. I mean, and here's one then I'll throw out to uh, people who are listening. If anyone's in that situation, maybe one of the ways would be to write up a few notes around what you've heard from the talks over API days and share that back with your team. So you're showing and sharing some of that, um, uh, the new knowledge that you've been acquiring. That might be one of those ways to demonstrate going yeah, above. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Okay, one, wonderful. Um, the the I, I also you also talked about the importance of like um some of the uh, uh some personal health sort of and well being approaches the mindful meditation. Do you are you familiar with any of the apps? Do you, or, or is there any technique that you suggest in particular around um how to be more mindful or or to take or to incorporate that into your daily practice? Uh, yeah, there are loads of apps. Uh, that you know some of the more famous ones that you can use but what works for you some people running works some people stress busting right. through doing the dishes works you know it works yep. it works for you eventually some people listening to music works some people taking their bike out on a ride works so it's you know being mindful not just through an app but it's whatever works for you Okay, yeah, cool. Uh, and great way to disconnect as well. Okay, wonderful. Um, thanks a lot for this uh, presentation, Madhu. It's breath of fresh air. <laughs>